Thank you, Reverend Fairley. On this expect, uh, expectation moment, as we move into another new year of expectations, I'm grateful for all those who turned out last night, and I'm grateful for those who tuned in last night, and I'm grateful to be on this line again. Uh, we're grateful tonight for another word from the Lord that gives us instruction on how to live, and how to love, and how to act, and how to think as Christians. Our scripture tonight is going to come from the book of 1 Timothy, the book of 1 Timothy, and we're going to focus tonight in the sixth chapter of 1 Timothy. Um, if you was if you turn there, I'll just give you a little background on the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy was written by Paul. It was written between his um his his Roman uh, jailings. His first Roman imprisonment is when he wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And then his last Roman uh, imprisonment was when he wrote 2 Timothy. But this was in between. And so Paul was in um, Macedonia, maybe even Philippi when he wrote this letter. Uh, Paul wrote it again for, uh, for to instruct the believers uh, that were that Timothy was uh, pastoring. Uh, Paul wrote it to them first of all to give them instructions on what they should believe. Uh, somebody might say, "Well, what does that mean, Pastor?" Well, he wanted them to understand what their faithfulness, what they needed to believe uh, in as, as Christians. He wanted to make sure uh, that false doctrine did not cloud their understanding and vision of who Christ is and what their relationship with them was all about. Let me pause here. Today I was having a conversation uh, with one of our members and, and I was uh, making a comparison between uh, the Catholic and, 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 and the Christian. Well, let me just start what I meant to say. The Catholic and say the Baptist or some other Protestant religion. And I was saying, the, the unfortunately, the Catholics are, are Christian. I'm not saying they're not. But they have inserted a separate person into the equation. That's the, the, the priest. The priest uh, who they have to go talk to um, in order that they may uh, receive forgiveness. And, and I was saying that the, the challenge is and the problem is and the sad part is that many in the, in the Christian, in the Baptist church or the Methodist church or whatever, uh, don't fully understand the beauty of the relationship we have with God through Jesus Christ. One of the reasons I always say the relationship with God through Jesus Christ is that's what we have. There's no other person needs to be there with us. You know, you, I, my job is to preach. You don't have to come to me and say, Pastor, I need forgiveness because you have a, a, a high priest, um, a Jesus. Uh, the, the, the savior of the world, um, whose work was to intercede on our behalf, whose work actually is to intercede on our behalf. The enemy wants you to think that you still, there's a, a separation between uh, the saved person and God, but the reality is they're not. The minute we receive Jesus Christ, I say, remember what Romans said? Romans says we have access unto this grace. That means when we accept Christ, guess where we are? We're in his presence. We are experiencing his presence. His presence is in us, and we can talk to him all the time, anytime, 24-7, about whatever we need to talk to him about. This is what was uh, uh, Timothy was trying to, uh, uh, make, part of what Timothy was trying to make plain, that fa the, the, the false doctrine that some of the, that some of the um, other preachers were preaching was, to, was, was seeking to peel the Christian slightly away uh, from, from Jesus and focus the Christian more on something that would benefit them, whether it be themselves or somebody else, whatever the case was, uh, that was their purpose. And so Paul wanted to make sure that false doctrine did not live in the church in which Timothy um, um, passed. Um, he explained here at the end of chapter one um, that, that there was a battle going on, um, that there was challenges that were faced. Some had rejected um, their faith in Christ because of whatever situation we're going through. He talked about two men, Hymenus and Alexander, who had turned around and made it. He, he defined, describes making a shipwreck, shipwreck of their faith because they had turned away from Jesus Christ. He said, and Paul says, and I've delivered them to Satan, not meaning that he turned them over to Satan, but he left them alone so that, that Satan would rip them so that they would perhaps come back to Jesus Christ. He wanted that to happen so they would be turned away from their evil ways and turned back to God so they would no longer blaspheme God. That's what he did in chapter one. In chapter two, he gave instructions for the church. He taught how to pray in chapter two. He taught uh, how to live as men and women of God in chapter two. Um, he explained in chapter two some practical aspects of living as a Christian. In chapter three, he continued that theme by explaining to the qualification of a church leader. The reason why Paul did that, because as they, this church began to grow, there was a necessity for leadership. Paul wanted to make sure that leadership was not a popularity contest, or leadership was not uh, who had the most friends and the most family. Leaders, um, the qualification of the church leader was who exhibited Christ in their lives more than anybody else. Um, in chapter four, this is where we, he started talking about leadership, elders, how they should no longer uh, fall prey. They should be too mature to fall prey to demonic leaders, demonic spirits, but instead stand strong as good servants of Jesus Christ. 
Uh, he moves on as instructed in the end of chapter 4 about ministry. Let me read chapter 4, verse 11. He said, command and teach these things, these things that, that we should labor and put our hope in the living God. He said, teach these things, command these things. No, nobody, uh, and he's talking about the, the, the gap between youth and elder, youth and mature. Let me say, let me pause here. Um, sometimes in the church, let me say this, as pastoral, that there's always a gap between elders and young people because the elders, uh, sometimes we think we know it all and the young people, and I put, notice I put myself in the elders because I'm older now. 57, I like that way I'm wearing that one. And the young people sometimes uh, feel like well, they won't let us do our, do our part. But in this in these verses here, it's very clear that Paul gives the solution to that problem. Elders should respect the youth, and the youth should respect the elders. The elders, the, the youth should not despise their youth. I wish I was older, but instead enjoy um, their relationship with God and let it grow so they may become uh, examples of others in their in their lifestyle, in their what they say and how they love. That's what he says uh, in, in chapter in chapter four. So in other words, there's a unique relationship that should exist in the church of mutual respect uh, and, and, and constant um, coordination, quite spiritual coordination between both the young Christian and the older Christian. And that the older Christian encourages and teaches the young, young Christian and the young Christian uh, respects that and, and takes what they learn and, and, and live it out, act it out. Uh, I was reading an article the other day, y'all watch sports that, uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers picked up Russell Wilson, who's won a Super Bowl, and Justin Fields, who ain't never won nothing. But what he, what they, the reason they put them together is potentially because Russell Wilson could demonstrate to Justin Fields, who's in his youthful stage, how to practice, how to how to prepare for being a, a Super Bowl champion. Uh, and as a result, Justin Fields has to respect what what um, Russell Wilson's done. The same thing true in Christ. If, if I tell my children this all the time about life, and it's, it's applies to the uh, to our Christian walk as well. I reminded my son the other day, if, if y'all let it be 155, if I'm still around, I still know more than you because I got more time in it than you in, in life. And the same thing is true about the life of Christ. We, all of us in Christ have seen ups and downs, but what we learned, we learned that God is good and all of them. And so I, we got the, the benefit of experience. Remember faith, uh, faith, um, faith, work is experience, experience, work and hope. We got experience. But at the same time, we should share it. We should not be mad at somebody because they're young. We should share what God has shown us through our experience to the younger people. That's chapter five. I didn't mean to stop there, but that's the Lord put that on my heart. In chapter five, he moves on and talks about um, supporting widows and honoring the elders. Uh, in chapter six, he's talking about honoring those who have authority over. That's what we're going today. Honoring those who are masters, who have authority. Um, he talked about in, in the beginning in verse um, three, um, false doctrine, human greed. He came back to that about the, the, the real doctrine um, and understanding the false, false doctrine just does not agree with what God says at all. Let me let me pause here. Let me read um, chapter 6, beginning at verse 3 to get context for the night. He said, teach and encourage these things. Verse 3, if anyone teaches other doctrine and does not agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching that promotes godliness, that person is conceited. They don't understand nothing. But they have a sick interest. Look at this in disputes and arguments over words. Let me pause here. In other words, what Paul was trying to explain to Timothy is anybody who does not want to rejoice in the sound teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ and wants to debate the little things, that person relating about Jesus, they just about arguing, they just about by fussing. Anybody got somebody that you know that they're fussing about anything? I don't care, sky blue. Well, I don't know, it's kind of absurd. Or if the wind is blowing, the wind is blowing from east, now it's from the west. This is what Paul is talking about in a spiritual sense. Some folks just want to argue about little things. And Paul says, don't do it. If they don't agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, then that's, they, got to, they, they want to just fight and argue. And Paul said it's sick. It's sick to want to dispute all the time. It's sick to want to argue all the time. Paul says, that, for that same person, look at verse, I'm in verse three, verse four. These come out of these, this kind of conversation, these kind of people come envy, quarreling, slander, evil suspicions, and constant disagreement upon people whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. But godliness with contentment is a great gain. In other words, some people always come up with some, um, uh, let, me, let, me, let me see if I can get an example. Reverend Stanley might remember this. There was a guy who used to do the same thing long before I was pastor. And I forget his name. He wasn't a pastor. He was a preacher. And he always was coming up with, I thought, gimmicks to try to get people to follow him. He had said he had a new gospel. You remember that? He had an um, a end time gospel, as he said, that he had created this whole thing. And he would argue anybody about that the end time gospel that you couldn't find it nowhere between Genesis and Revelation, couldn't find it. 
but it was his thing. And it came to re- I came to realize that what he was trying to do was to try to make a gain out of trying to be super spiritual, super deep. And I'm not, this doesn't happen in St. Peter, but it happens in the world. And we need to be careful so it never creeps in St. Peter to be aware. If somebody's preaching the gospel that's not going to grow up in Christ, if somebody's preaching the gospel that's not going to grow in the word, then we understand that they're not doing it for Christ. They're doing it for who? Themselves. But on the flip side, Paul says in verse six, godliness with contentment is a great gain. If you can live for the Lord in a godly fashion and, and, it, and it doesn't matter the situation around you, guess what? You're going to be blessed. It's a great game. If you, it, that means that if you say, I'm going to stick to this relationship I got with God, I ain't going to let nothing shake me no matter what. Guess what? That's a great game. You're going to be benefited. You're going to be blessed in your walk with the Lord. Let me get to verse seven. Paul reminds us this right here. And this is true for everybody. I don't care. I don't know who the richest man in the world is. But whoever he is, this is the truth for him just as well as somebody else. But we brought nothing into the world. Y'all would agree with that, right? None of us, none of us are born with, with, with anything in our pockets. We have no pockets to be born in. And Paul says, and we can take nothing out. Uh, Reverend, El- Reverend Elvis, you back there. I know Deacon Elvis back there somewhere. Ain't nobody never been buried with a dump truck with their with they money behind it. Can't go with them. Y'all realize that. Okay, keeping that in mind. Paul said, but if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with these. Paul is not saying, I want y'all poor. Paul is saying that the Christian has to be content on the inside no matter what. No matter what. I had another conversation today about sickness. Somebody says, you know, and it's true. Sickness, sickness is aimed for the aim for the weak hearted. Because sickness, thinking about being sick can make you sick. But if you trust in God, you just put your hand in his hand. And you trust that he's going to walk you to where you need to be. That's, that's all. You just put your hand in his hand. You said, I'm content with what? That the Lord is with me. I said that before. Throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, the most common words is the Lord saying, I'll be with you. That, uh, uh, and God saying, I'll be with you. That's the most comforting words. And that's what he's saying right here. We can be content with whatever we have when we know the Lord. Now, look at verse 9. I'm sorry. I'm going to land it now. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation. That's true. You ain't got to be rich to fall into temptation. Anybody that want, anybody that whole mindset, y'all don't feel like that. They just, they just want, if I can win this lottery, if, if, if I can just get this better job, they think that their solution is in money. Can I say this right here? I think some of us on this line know tonight that money ain't going to change your life. If you ain't saved, you just be a rich seller. And if you, and if money is the only thing you want, guess what? You're going to miss out not only on an abundant life in this world, but you're going to miss out on eternal life in, 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 in eternity with the Lord. And I'm talking to unsaved people. Did that? And saved people can be the same way. We can want to have, want to have, want to have. And Paul says this, with those who want to be rich, sponsor temptation, it's a trap. And many fully and harmful desires plunge people into ruin and destruction. Chasing, chasing money, chasing stuff, chasing things. Deacon Thomas, we talked about that one time. Chasing stuff, it ain't nothing but stuff. That's all it is, the stuff. Because stuff be here and stuff be gone. Every time I leave my backpack in the car and forget to lock the car, I said, what if anybody got my stuff? You know, because my but that's the thing about my stuff. Somebody can open the door and say, oh, I'm gonna take your stuff. But can't nobody take your relationship with God. Can't nobody take your joy. Can't nobody take your peace. Can't nobody take that when you have a relationship with God. Paul says, don't chase stuff because it'll cause you ruin and destruction. Verse 10, he says, for the love of money. Read that. It doesn't say money. It says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And we crave it. He says, some folk have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pain. Some people have caused themselves pain because they love money so much. Now, I, I said all that to get to verse 11, verse 12. Paul says, but you, man of God, so I'm talking to y'all, you men and women of God, run from these things. Run from the temptation of stuff, money. Run from a, a covetousness and a, and a crass craving of, of, of material things, worldly things. Run from it. And what should you do? Pursue righteousness. The same energy that you would use chasing stuff, use that energy to do what? Chase righteousness. I say this all the time. And I can say it because I've been there and now God's got me a whole other place. If you say, well, I don't have time for Bible study. I don't have time to pray. I, I got I to gotta get mine. I got to get mine. Guess what? You run it right off the cliff. But if you chase Jesus, if you pursue righteousness, if you pursue godliness, try to live more like God, if you pursue depths of faith, if you pursue love and God and love your neighbor, if you pursue endurance and say, I'm just going to hold on and trust God and see what they ain't going to be. If you trust gentleness, guess what? If you, verse 12, if you fight the good fight for the faith, if you get, that's what's going to happen. You will take hold of eternal life that you were called to. Let me pause right there. I like that right there. Here's the thing. Paul is talking to saved folk. He said you were called to eternal life. He said, but the only way you get to fully experience that process to eternal life 
is to chase, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and justice, and fight the good fight for the faith. Paul shows here that he got a thing for, for uh, exertion. You know, in 2 Timothy, uh, he also talked about um, being a father in, in, in the Olympic races. Paul is simply saying that to be a Christian, you got to exert yourself for the Lord. How about that? You got to give your best to the Lord. That's all he's saying. Exert yourself for the Lord so that you may take hold of eternal life. It's not that you're going to miss eternal life, but you want to, you want to, what we want to do down here is know and walk in the reality that eternal life is already ours. That changes your perspective, your mindset. Paul said that's what we're called to do. Every one of us in Christ will call to eternal life. Do y'all know that? When we receive Jesus as our Savior, eternal life was is we, we got an appointment. Like if you go to a restaurant now, you can get on an app called um 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 it's called um open table. And you put your little reservation in there, and a few minutes later, um, if you put your reservation in a few minutes later, um, you you they'll say you got a point, you got a reservation. All you gotta do between that moment, wherever that time is. And the time you're supposed to be there is, is, is keep on going what you got to do because at a certain time, your reservation is going to be ready. When you accept Christ as your Savior, there's an appointment made for you in heaven. And when, when that day comes that you leave here, guess what? You're, they they waiting on you at the door. They're, they're, they're Jesus wait and say, well done, that good and faithful servant. Because we have done those things. We have made an appointment when we receive Jesus. All we got to do is run and run on. Run on how? Pursuing righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and justice. All we got to do is fight the good fights of faith. Don't let us be beat by uh, our flesh, but let the spirit win out. And then he says that we will call to. That's what we're called to. And have made a good confession by in the present many, many weeks. If you're a Christian and you walk and you're doing these things, guess what you're doing? You are confessing to the world, I belong to Jesus. If you are pursuing righteousness, the world sees you, they know that person pursuing Jesus. If you are being godly and faithful and loving and enduring and justice, if you're fighting a good fight of faith, you are making a good confession. In this case, Paul means like a profess. You let the world know who you belong to. And you can do it, Paul says, in the presence of many witnesses. That means that Paul is saying that we ought to do this at work, at home, in church, with our families, at Kroger, at Publix, wherever we go. If we do these things, that we will have a, 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 you might not get a plaque from nobody down here, but you will hear the word well done. And it's 1 Corinthians 15 says that our works will follow us. How about that? Our works will follow us. I'm going to call the time out tonight, but I want to just leave that verse. This, 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 this verse right here um, is, is like a, for lack of a better uh, term, it's like a um, uh, uh, a plan, a, a plan of action for the Christian. You know, like if you go to the gym, they give you a workout plan. This is our spiritual workout plan that we may be strong in the Lord and that we may view our lives, not just in time, but also in eternity. I'm going to stop tonight. I'm going to get back in with the kids in here, but I'm at the church. But I thank God for each of you for tuning in tonight on the phone line, the Zoom line. I do want to tell somebody, if you got grandkids, great-grandkids, nieces, nephews, cousins, make sure that we get you a speech for each to bring them Sunday, uh, because next week, Thursday, next week, sat um, Saturday, we're going to be preparing for our Easter Sunday morning with our kids. I'm looking forward to our kids. And, and it's question to be said, well, Pastor, all they're doing is saying speeches, but how about this? How about they could be saying a whole lot of other stuff? But if they're talking about Jesus, that's the seed that's planted. If they talk about Jesus, that's something they will never forget. I've come to learn when the kids here learn something. I, I was just tickled pink the other day. I think it was a couple of Sundays ago. The one of the kids was walking by just singing a song that the, the youth choir sang. That made me so happy because they would, what got downloaded in their spirit was something about the Lord. You know, when they go to school, guess what? Who's still in there? The Lord. When they go to practice, the Lord is in there. God bless you tonight. Let us pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you tonight, Lord, for your word and for your power. I pray, God, tonight as we prepare to dismiss from this place and in, this, in, in, in our phone lines and Zoom lines, Lord, you just keep your hands on us, Lord, and let us keep our eyes on you. God, we love you because you loved us first when we were dead in our sins. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, your peace, your joy, and your love. We ask God tonight as we, as we go to bed that you give us the sleep of the righteous. But, Lord, in the meantime, let us pursue godliness. Let us pursue love. Let us pursue uh, faith. Let us fight the good fight, Lord, that we may be witnesses and, and testify, Lord, to how good you have been. It is in Jesus' name we thank you, Lord, and we praise your name. Amen. God bless you. Hold on, Zoom line. God bless your phone line.